Hello and good morning. Um, my name is Morris Ryan. I'm a geotechnical engineer and associate director uh, with Burn Luby Partners um, based in their Dublin office. Um, today I'll be making a presentation on uh, my paper for the conference, which is titled Basement Construction in Dublin and Interaction with the Underlying Calp Limestone. Uh, professionally, I've uh, signif significant experience uh, in the design and construction of, of deep basements in city centre. Uh, locations and uh, assessing ground conditions and control of groundwater associated uh, with the deep basement construction. Uh, today I'll talk about some methods used and adopted in Dublin and, and how over you know the last number of decades how items have changed and uh, the, the depth of basements increased and also maybe a, a brief look to the, the future and some expected deep basements associated with some upcoming uh, infrastructure projects. I suppose, you know, uh, in, in an ideal world, if constructing a basement, um, you generally would have a, a nice open uh, site, you know, plenty of room, uh, you can batter back your sides of your excavation, so you, you don't need any type of temporary retaining walls, um, you also, you're outside the zone of influence for, for causing any damage to any adjacent structures or third party properties, and uh, this is the ideal way to, to carry out a basement excavation. Once you get down to your formation level, um, prepare the formation, uh, put down your waterproofing and, and construct your, your basement uh, uh, floor slab. Following that, you can construct your rising elements, get your waterproofing on the, the vertical elements, um, follow, following which you can then uh, dress the waterproofing around the joints and certify that it's all uh, intact and, and suitably installed. And that's it. Uh, basement constructed, backfill around the sides and continue with your structure. Um, that type of uh, scenario though is is very seldom the case uh, when looking at, at city centre uh, locations. Um, in, in, in these urban areas when you're constructing basements, you're generally trying to optimise and maximise the, the available space in order to uh, get the, the best value out of the site. So because of that, you're, you're typically tight up against neighbouring properties, tight up against sensitive infrastructure, sensitive services, and often it's it's necessary to adopt solutions to allow you to carry out the basement excavations tight to the site boundary. Um, and that, 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 that summarizes there in terms of, uh, you know, what's generally the, the case, um, as was equally when you're carrying out these, type, these basements in city center locations. Control of groundwater is, is always a very important aspect. Uh, as was in, in terms of um, the two critical elements there, it, it'd be lateral deflection of your uh, temporary works. Uh, so, you know, if you've embed a pile retaining wall around the perimeter, uh, it's controlled deflection of that, and then equally to prevent the ingress of groundwater, which would act to lower the groundwater table in the surrounding areas, which, which could in, in turn uh, generate settlement uh, or cause settlements of uh, adjacent footings of foundations, which could damage or impair the serviceability of, of third party properties. Uh, the, the general solution adopted uh, uh, around the, the globe really and, and the industry practice is the, the use of embedded pile retaining walls. So these are elements that are uh, installed along the, the line of the, the basement that you wish to construct uh, ahead of the excavation. Um, these can form concrete, uh, concrete piles which are drilled and concreted and, and placed for reinforcement or sheet piling or diaphragm walls. Um, you know, so these typical solutions uh, can be quite stiff elements or, or quite flexible and can re require various degrees of uh, restraint in order to achieve the necessary excavation level while meeting the deflection criteria uh, of, of the project. And equally, the, the toe level of these particular elements uh, is typically ensured to to provide a, a groundwater cutoff to prevent any base flow through the or beneath the toe of the wall and then uh, up through the base of the excavation. Um, so a number of these typical solutions which are typically used in in Ireland and, and, and further afield. Um, so for concrete 
concrete piles, there, there's two types of solutions uh, which are generally adopted. Uh, the first is a contiguous pile retaining wall. Uh, for this particular solution, all the piles are, are structurally reinforced. Um, you drill to the necessary depth and the cage is either plunged into the wet concrete if a CFA pile is used or uh, placed in the open bore of a rotary bore pile following or followed, following which the, the concrete be trimmed in place. Uh, these particular piles are arranged with a, a gap or a space between the piles. Um, the spacing varies from 100 to 250 millimetres and as such no groundwater cutoff will be provided by, by this arrangement. Uh, it's generally more suited to cohesive deposits where uh, the soil will arch between the piles and won't tend to fall out. Uh, in water bearing gravels uh, it's, it's generally not an adopted solution because there can be ground loss between the piles and, and water ingress which can result in washout of fines and settlement behind the wall. So this particular solution is generally adopted where groundwater is not deemed an issue and where you have cohesive deposits which will, will um, uh, span and, and arch between the piles. Uh, the, the other piled uh, option is a seeking pile arrangement. So this is a, a sequential installation approach where uh, a series of primary and secondary piles are installed. Uh, the primary piles are, are generally a softer, firm concrete strength, so, so an unreinforced element. Uh, these are installed first in sequence and following the installation of the primary piles, the secondary hard piles, which are structurally reinforced concrete, are installed. These intersect the primary piles to form an interlocking arrangement of piles, which will form uh, a suitable cut off the groundwater and also will prevent any ground loss uh, you know during your excavation so this particular photograph here illustrates a seeking pile wall for uh, basin excavation in on Burlington Road uh, the seeking arrangement obviously is is visible here uh, along the boundary and then there was also a sub basement uh, within the, the the middle of the basement which was uh, excavated open cut in the the calp limestone you can see the the calp uh, exposed here um, you know, guide walls are generally installed for, for this arrangement in order to maintain the, the interlock and, and setting out of the piles. And it's, it's a, a well-proven technique in, uh, in Dublin, especially in the, the boulder clays and gravels uh, in achieving a cutoff. Um, other options uh, include sheet piling. Um, this is an alternative to concrete piles. Uh, however, it's very dependent on the ground conditions which are present on the particular site. It can provide uh, groundwater uh, control and cutoff with suitable joint sealants or welding of the clutches. Um, but typically in urban city centre locations, uh, it can prove quite difficult to use this approach given uh, the need for either a, a vibratory installation method or an impact uh, driven method. Uh, equally, the, the ground conditions specifically in Dublin often do not uh, uh, facilitate the, the easy installation sheet piles. It's it's only as you progress towards the port area where the the depth of softer deposits facilitate sheet pile installation. So uh, there would be be limited deep basements constructed with sheet piles in in Dublin anyway specifically. Cork uh, there there will be uh, with the depth of gravels there there will be more opportunity for the use of sheet piles. Uh, the, one of the final options and probably the more costly is the diaphragm retaining walls. Um, so these uh, particular solutions are, are much stiffer, much more robust than the other options, um, and essentially form uh, they are formed through the the excavation of a a trench uh, along the line of the proposed basement. Uh, this is generally supported by a, a bentonite support fluid or alternative support fluid in the temporary sense. Uh, once the trench is excavated, um, the reinforcement cage is is dropped in through the support fluid. And then concrete is, is tremied from the bottom up, displacing the support flute. So this, this process constructs very stiff panels, which are, are interlocking and, you know, is, is generally used for, for very deep excavations. Uh, you know, you typically see this type of solution adopted for uh, metro station boxes and such. Um, there's been a number of, of instances where this has been used in, in Dublin, um, but, but not of, uh, of recent. I think there was a, one of the more recent ones was the the matter stop box for the metro, the former Metro North line. Uh, this was uh, at one side of the Metro box was constructed by BAM uh, during the development of the, the matter hospital, uh, which actually straddled the originally proposed uh, station box construction there. So that, that is available for for completion if the, the, the alignment was to change to, to match back up with the original Metro North uh, alignment. 
I suppose the, the issue with that particular solution also is the, the extensive site footprint that's needed in terms of uh, the, the bentonite support fluid. So, you know, you need to recycle the fluid, uh, you know, take the debris out of it, clean it and reuse it. So a significant site footprint is needed to uh, adopt such a solution. And so then this is just a, a comparison of the relevant costs of uh, each, each solution. So, you know, for, for sheet pile retaining walls, obviously your retained heights vary from five to 15 meters. Um, and, and it illustrates it's on the, the lower the lower end of the, the, the relative unit cost. Uh, contiguous then can facilitate deeper excavation depths and retained heights between 10 and 30 meters. Secant so again progresses on to 15 to 40 meters. Uh, it's, it's generally reliant on the ability of the drilling equipment to maintain interlock and achieve interlock and maintain alignment. So uh, that's why the diaphragm walling is, is generally adopted for, for excavation depths greater than the 30 to 40 meter length. Uh, you know, there's concern that you would have uh, out of tolerance or out of position of, of drill piles with the secant uh, depths greater than 30 to 40 meters. So that's what's generally drives the use of a, a diaphragm wall. So that's just a, use, a useful understanding of the, the relative cost of one versus the other, um, which is taken from Sirius E760, uh, an economic design of embedded retaining walls uh, design guide, which is, is very useful if uh, uh, you want to understand some more about the, uh, the design and specification of, of embedded walls. I suppose in, in terms of basement construction, uh, you know, the desire is generally to, to maximize the site value and the underground space that is available. Um, you know, the, there's, there's been substantial urban development in, in recent decades. And, you know, this has increased the typical basement depths which are being constructed. Um, you know, up to the mid nineties, it was generally a single, uh, occasionally double story basement. So three to six meters deep. And these are generally have been constructed with smaller diameter CFA piles, uh, relatively flexible uh, which, you know, propping as needed, uh, you know, the, the type of equipment uh, available at the time would have precluded, you know, some deep basements within the, the bedrock and, uh, you know, the drillability of the rock with the plant, you know, from the 2000 onwards, uh, the depth of basement generally increased to, you know, double to triple. So, so eight to 12 meters with the occasional uh, basement in the range of 15 to 16 meters. Again, you know, the, the availability of plant to drill the overburden and install the, the, the pile was, uh, generally improved and increased um, to such an extent where we're now in the, the capabilities of, you know, deep excavations in the range of 20 to 30, mil 30 meters uh, below ground meter, below ground level, apologies. And I suppose this is what's going to be expected for some of the deeper station boxes for the, for the upcoming Metrolink project. Uh, one of the recent ones, uh, which are one of the more recent ones, which has actually partially commenced is the, the Charlemont uh, or Metro Link station box. So there's currently a, a commercial development which straddles the future station box location. Uh, some initial piling has been commenced there to, to facilitate the eventual construction of station box, which is in the order of 28 meters deep. So, you know, the, the modern plant is now capable of, you know, meeting those type of installation depths. And I suppose those deeper depths uh, I suppose have, have, have meant a, a greater interaction with the, the calp limestone in Dublin uh, in terms of forming basements within the rock. And I suppose there's a, a number of station boxes in that Metrolink line, which will involve some substantial uh, excavations within the limestone rock uh, to get to the necessary formation levels. Uh, I suppose in, in terms of the geology of Dublin, uh, you know, the, the bedrock profile published by the GSI outlines the expected depth and range of depth to bedrock. Uh, in the south of the city, it's, it's city centre. It's generally quite shallow between five to 10 metres typically, um, whereas north of the Liffey, it, it does dip off and there, there is the old river channel there uh, and the, 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 the much deeper formation level there of the rock. So generally where we've interacted with the the bedrock during the base construction tends to be to the south of the, the city. And in these areas, the bedrock is generally overlain by the glacial till, the cohesive glacial till. So, you know, there's a, a protective layer of the boulder clay overlying the, the bedrock. Um, you know, the, the, the bedding of the, the limestone is also generally favorable, uh, you know, generally close to horizontally bedded, uh, you know, so when excavating and forming basins through this, that, that is quite favorable in terms of an approach 
uh, for maintaining the stability of the of the rock itself uh, during excavation. Uh, you know, the, the plants and equipment which uh, is used to form the piles and embedded uh, retaining walls uh, in order to, to drill and achieve the embedment into the rock. It's either going to be a, a rotary board piling solution, which in, involves the installation of temporary casings through the overburden, uh, which act to support the hole um, to allow a follow on rock core bucket uh, to be drilled repeatedly into the rock and extracted to uh, remove the debris and allow the bore to, to continue on. An alternative is a, an old extra down the hole hammer. Uh, this used compressed air to drive an eccentric bit, which essentially pulverizes the, the rock and blows the, the dust back up through the, through the bore uh, to allow the, the bit to get to the necessary toe level, following which uh, it can either be concreted with a, a CFA auger or alternatively if a, a casing is used with a, a trendy pipe. I suppose, you know, the, the issue with the construction of the basements within the, the limestone rock is the cost and time associated with with drilling the rock and um, CFA piling is, is generally predominantly used in the overburden in in our, in Dublin and, and wider field in Ireland. Once you get to drilling the rock, it, it becomes a much slower and much more costly exercise. So this has driven some e efficiencies um, to innovate and reduce the time and cost associated with the installation of the embedded pile retaining walls in, in the in the limestone. Was what has what is, is generally been adopted is the seeking arrangement is installed through the overburden. Uh, that's in order to support any soils which, which may unravel if a contiguous arrangement is used in the overburden and also to get a toe in into the, the top of the intact rock. Uh, the male piles, the secondary piles are then installed uh, full depth and with the primary pile stopping on the rock head, this results in a contiguous arrangement continuing on into the bedrock formation. So where you've actually, where you tend to excavate into the bedrock formation, uh, this results in a, an exposed face being formed between the piles once you're within the bedrock formation. And I suppose the natural bedding of the rock, this is where that comes to be an advantage in terms of the, the rock is, is relatively stable and, and will span from pile to pile. Uh, and as what well, the issue tends to be the control of groundwater. And that's what we'll discuss in the next number of slides. So I suppose the, the kelp limestone is, is generally a, a moderately productive uh, aquifer, um, or sorry, it's a locally important aquifer and, and moderately productive in, in local zones. It's the rock formation is generally seen to be tight and dry. Uh, however, some individual fractures or faults may produce flows in, in the range of five to 20 liters a second. Um, experience of double and triple level basement excavation within the rock has, has generally shown that we're, we be, expect discharge rates of between six to 12 liters a second from you know, various basement footprints. Uh, we, we generally find that the rock isn't overly productive uh, you, you may find local fault lines where there's a, you know, a, a more appreciable groundwater ingress, um, but this can be equal, easily managed by, um, you know, some pumping and, and drainage lines uh, around the perimeter of the, of the basement. Uh, this was one of the more interesting case studies where such a, a solution was adopted was the the Royal College of Surgeons uh, development on York Street. Um, so this particular development commenced back in 2006, uh, or 2007, apologies. And that particular basement, it was a triple story uh, excavation with a, a, a bit of a, an, an undercraft. Um, and, and that ended up being a, a 19 meter deep basement excavation in total depth. Um, the geology in the area and the, the overburden was, was generally eight meters of uh, May ground and boulder clay. Uh, lying directly on top of the, the kelp limestone. Uh, the kelp in this particular location was, was almost entirely horizontally bedded. And as was the appetite for risk at the time was, was probably a bit more than it is now. And as such, the, the seeking arrangement was installed through the, the overburden and towed into the top of the intact rock. And essentially the, the rock face was then excavated vertically uh, to get to the, the formation level. Now, every fourth male pile, um, I think you might see it. Uh, th this, this is the male pile here. There's another one here, maybe another one here. 
the mail piles were extended, every fourth mail pile was extended to uh, account for some vertical capacity to accommodate the, the vertical component that a tieback anchor loads here. So, you know, there, although there was some piles brought full depth, uh, it wasn't to maintain stability of the rock face. It was literally to accommodate the, the vertical load from the ground anchor installation. So obviously that, that, you know, there's a substantial open face in that basement. And generally once at formation level, the groundwater was found to be managed via sump pumping and uh, drainage uh, trenches across the, the formation. And I think the average uh, discharge rate was in the, the region of 20 liters a second. And, and that was managed uh, via, via sump pumping. So it, it can be seen that it is, is it, it can be, such deep excavations can be carried out within the limestone uh, and can be managed in temporary condition without extensive uh, dewatering requirements. I suppose in, in terms of an eye on the future developments uh, with the Metrolink as, as mentioned earlier, uh, you know, there's several of those station boxes which are in the range of, of 20 to 30 meters deep. Um, you know, with, with, with that uh, particular piece of infrastructure, uh, the scheme design uh, is likely to adopt a conservative approach where uh, you know, it might be diaphragm walls, full height uh, in order to retain ground and, and cut off groundwater. Uh, you know, there, there's likely to be design and build solutions put forward by contractors, which would adopt some of these solutions to offer efficiencies to time and cost associated with the, with the construction of the, the deep uh, embedded retaining walls. And I suppose this, this brings out that, you know, we need adequate site investigation and, and, and an understanding of the groundwater is crit critical and cr crucial to ensure the efficient and rob yet robust design of these measures. Um, so, so detailed assessment and modeling of, of the short and long-term impacts of, of these deep excavations is necessary. And it will be certainly interesting to understand what has been developed in the site investigation, which is, is just being completed for Metrolink. Uh, I do understand that there's been a number of uh, pump tests carried out and there there was one that I've discussed in the paper for the uh, the, the pumping or sorry the, the site at Charlemont which proved uh, you know to, to justify some of the expected volumes that that we would expect if the typical arrangement of the secant and contiguous in rock was adopted for such a station box so that's just a, a very brief introduction to um, you know basement retaining wall options and, and how it interacts with the the limestone bedrock uh, happy to answer any questions if uh, if any may have arised. Thank you very much.